Thank you for joining us today in episode 87 of the Pool Chasers podcast. As always, our mission is to help educate and inspire in the form of a podcast. So things are starting to come together for our live Long Beach show. We are going to be discussing 1099 independent contractors and W-2 employees with the goal to help everyone define each one and what steps to take to transition somebody to an employee if that's what is needed to be done. We will have three incredible pool professionals on stage with us for the conversation, all of which have been on the podcast before. Rich Gallo, Javier Payan, and Dustin Anderson. It's going to be a great discussion that you don't want to miss. So to get your free tickets, go to poolchasers.com forward slash events or click the link below. For today's episode, we sat down with our friends at Anderson Manufacturing Company to discuss a topic that has been asked for many times, and that is leak detection. Kyle and I had the opportunity to go to their facility in Minnesota to take their training and to record this episode with them. We love the Anderson team, their culture, and all their products, so it was a great time and we learned a ton while we were there. During the episode, we break down symptoms of a leak, what leak detection is exactly, how to find a leak, and what tools Anderson has to offer that will help through the whole process. For those that have been asking for this episode for a long time, we promise you won't be disappointed. This episode is full of knowledge and information to help you understand what leak detection is all about. So please enjoy this episode with Lance Anderson and Brad Madison of Anderson Manufacturing Company. Welcome to your go-to podcast for the pool and spa industry. My name is Tyler Rasmussen. And my name is Greg Diafania. And this is the Pool Chasers Podcast. All right. Well, we recently introduced Anderson Manufacturing as a new sponsor of the show. And now we're sitting here in their manufacturing plant here in St. Paul, Minnesota. We have the pleasure of recording an episode while we're here as well. So thank you both for joining us on the podcast today. Well, yeah, it's you bet. great to be on the podcast. And it's nice to have you here in snowy Minnesota. <laughs> Yes, very cold. <laughs> Much different. We flew here from Orlando from the trade show to here, and I took a picture on the Instagram like when we went to Orlando, and then like we went to Minnesota, so it's a, it's a much different experience. <laughs> <laughs> so can you please introduce yourself to listeners? All right, I'm Lance Anderson. I'm the owner of Anderson Manufacturing Company. My name is Brad Madison, and I am a technical sales and training manager for Anderson Manufacturing. Awesome. Thank you. Well, Kyle and I had the opportunity to go through the leak detection training with you all yesterday, and it definitely opened my eyes to a whole new way of thinking about it, which was pretty awesome. So what did you think about it, Kyle? I thought it was pretty awesome coming at it from uh, just a pool service kind of aspect, thinking about how differently I would have looked at pools having this knowledge. Like, oh, I would have checked the skimmer for... Not for debris, but maybe a crack along the edge or, you know, all the different things that you sh kind of showed us how to look for leaks in the training. I sure. would have used that at a pool. I would have kind of went, oh, OK, that's where you would look for a leak there. And that's how Oh, these are kind of signs of leaks. And maybe I would have had a couple even thinking about it, talking about it last night, three or four pools that probably had leaks in them. And we could have maybe detected them with the training that we had. Yeah, sure. Yeah, and I think, you know, we also learned, you know, the, the little things to look at, like a green pool, you could see like the the clear spot that is leaking because all the chemicals were going into, stuff like that. You know, it's pretty pretty cool to be learning about all that stuff for sure. Yeah. <laughs> I think we like to kind of try to present that it's not as difficult as it's made out to be sometimes. And with some good, easy, basic training, leaks are manageable and something to go after. For sure. Oh. Yep. Well, we were talking yesterday, Lance, about, you know, all the history within the company. Um, you know, it's been around for a very long time. So can you go back to the beginning and share with us how the business got started? Yeah, sure. Well, way back in the 1950s, I guess, uh, the company was called Anderson Radiator Repair. And it was actually owned by my grandfather, who was a Swedish immigrant. And uh, he had a radiator repair shop in Austin, Minnesota. And um in, in doing that, fixing farm machinery and auto re, uh, radiators, he invented rubber test plugs, um, which are very similar to the test plugs we're all familiar with in the swimming pool industry now. A piece of rubber on a stem with washer on each end and a, a wing nut on the top. He sold those to radiator repair shops around the country for repairing and pressure testing automotive radiators. Wow. Uh, yeah. 
he ended up, uh, he, he had one son who was my father, uh, who ended up being a physician and uh, becoming a doctor. And he was actually encouraged not to get into the radiator repair industry. My dad wanted him to go on and do better things. Um, but then uh, my grandfather died somewhat early, and uh, the radiator repair shop was taken over by his partner. But the pl little plug manufacturing business was something my dad thought would be a good college expense payer to bring up here to, to Roseville, Minnesota, which is about an hour and a half north of Austin. Okay. So his plan was that we'd start making these plugs in the basement, my brothers and I, on weekends and evenings. And uh, we did that for a number of years, and it was indeed a good little college expense payer that could be run out of our family's basement. Wow. So what, what age were you starting to put together plugs? Yeah, you know, I remember putting together plugs, um, boy, as, as young as elementary school. Really? Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't think it was actually moved to our basement until I was probably in junior high. Okay. But uh, we had a lot of, we spent a lot of weekends and evenings putting plugs together. You know, at the time I was kind of a, uh, I didn't think it was as great a thing as it's turned out to be sure. because all my other friends were getting jobs at cool places and hanging out with their friends and I was stuck in the basement with my brothers <laughs> putting plugs together. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, so be it. it. That was the opportunity I had and, and it turned out to be great. Sure. So, as things went on then, though, I went off to college, my brothers went off to college and the radiator industry started changing. Um, it turned out that they were no longer repairing radiators anymore. They were replacing them instead. So kind of while my brothers and I were away from the the business, the sales took a nosedive to the point where it looked like it wasn't necessarily going to survive. Um, when I graduated from college, um, I had another job for a little while, but then I decided I was going to jump back into the plug business because by that time my, my dad had made us part owners, my brothers and I, and I thought, man, we could, we got to be able to sell this business at least. So we've got to raise the sales up so it looks like it's growing. And, um, as I got in and started doing that, working on the business in the basement, we discovered that people were buying plugs um, from the radiator repair shops. These guys were swimming pool service companies who were buying the plugs because they worked so well for pressure testing plumbing lines around the swimming pools. Um, so pretty inventive, creative guys were finding a solution to what was not out there. Um, and that kind of, I thought, well, that's the, that's the opportunity to start turning this thing around. So we started listening to these guys a little bit more um, and trying to modify some of the plugs so they didn't just work for radiators, they actually worked for the purposes that the, the pool guys had too. And that was things like putting an extension between the wing nut and the rubber so that they could make a seal inside the pipe and adapting the open stem plugs that were used in the radiator industry just with a rubber hose attached to them in such a way that they could be quick connected to a, a coupling system so that there was, it was easier to change sizes. Um, and it, it turns out that at the same time, the leak detection specialty was kind of evolving and growing into something that people were identifying could be really a, a real business that they could operate. And so we, we just kind of listened to those people and started hearing from them what they needed. And in addition to modifying the plugs, we started adding other products that were available also and used by these guys. And a lot of them were things that might, products that were used in other industries, for instance, but they just weren't able to get them all in one place. So we started adding listening devices and things like that. Wow. That's a, that's a pretty big transition, I think, you know, from, from radiators to pools, especially here in Minnesota. <laughs> yeah. You know, you, if you do have pools, it's very seasonal, but how did you know to to see that and and think that that was the way to go uh, i think it was just um listening i have kind of talked about that what was the secret to our growth at that point was just having big ears and um listening to what people needed and trying to fill the void that was out there um so that was really probably it more than anything um i i've had a saying before that part of what has helped me do well in this and grow is that I, I lead with my head and bump into a lot of things. And so a lot of it was just trying something and uh, listening and then not doing what didn't work and do what did. Wow. So. That's pretty awesome. It's a pretty cool transition from 
for a business to to make that shift and a lot of people could see that or maybe it's because they don't listen <laughs> well I, you know, I, i'm good i'm gonna chalk a lot of it up to luck too you know i was listening and there were certainly people who were who were looking for it in such a way that i didn't have much of a choice so sure. um it, it was a it was a great opportunity and we kind of found that as we then continued to sell product people were hungry for the knowledge of how to do it as well yeah and i think that's kind of where the the business really took off because initially i i was really just going to get into this thing just so i could get it sold and get on with a real career <laughs> yeah you know i didn't think selling radiator plugs or selling plugs to the pool industry was what i was going to be doing forever um but then started going to trade shows and started being asked about teaching and how this stuff was used and um what i kind of found was that it, people thought of it as a art um early on and they weren't quite sure exactly why things were working for them and what was the way to use these tools properly sure. um and i discovered that it wasn't necessarily an art and if it was the people who were consistently successful at it were doing similar things and they were treating it more like it was a science. And that's where I figured out that, you know, this could be taught in such a way that people could really understand the science and the process and the physics and what equipment worked. And um, that's kind of where we, we started building and growing a little bit and recognizing that this really was a niche that could be filled and other people could continue to be successful at it it wasn't just the artists that could be yeah so then the the industry started looking at you as as leak specialists right or, le or understanding leak detection and they just started asking you to to come talk at the trade shows and do things like that yeah yeah and um i think one time i got introduced as a leak detection guru Ooh. and uh <laughs> I, that, that the was guru. Kind of the guru right and uh, I don't know that it was deserved because, um, again, I think what I what I did was I was able to share knowledge on how to do this, but I didn't necessarily have a lot of the skill that I had been using in the field. Okay. So there were plenty of people out there who were really smarter at doing leaks, but what was unique about what I was able to do was put it together in kind of an understandable way that could be used by other people and presented in an hour and a half at a trade show. But it was... It was kind of when I got introduced as a guru that I thought, you know, this might be something I'm doing for longer than just getting this business sold. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think, um, you know, as a young kid growing up and having that in the basement and working, how, how do you think that impacted your thought process for life or changed the way you kind of thought about things. Cause that's a, it's a young age to be doing those things. Yeah. And not a lot of people have that introduction to, you know, a business at that point. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think the, the best thing for me and what I still think is really a value in a small business is you get to see all parts of the business. You get to see the, the purchasing of the components. You see the production, you see the fulfillment, the fact that orders have to get out when customers want them. You see the marketing, the collection, and the accounting, um, and the paying of the payroll. You, you see all that kind of on a daily basis in a little microcosm, and you get a chance to participate in all of it. And I think that's been a real helpful thing for me. Um, and it was just, I, I think more than anything also, it was that uh, I worked when there were orders that had to get out. It wasn't like I was just punching the clock and putting my time in. It was that, man, I couldn't go out and do what I wanted to do this Friday night or this weekend, or if I did, I had to figure out when those orders were going to get out. And I think that was a helpful lesson. Yeah. When you wanted to go play in the snow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. a really good lesson to learn. I think, you know, you know, to, to give somebody that feeling of accomplishment or needing things to be accomplished and, and get that drive at a young age is, is important for, you know, especially if you're going to run, run a business. Right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you still kind of, at least from what we felt yesterday and a bit around you guys now quite a bit, it feels really kind of like the small family business feel here still. Um, can you tell us why it's important and kind of talk about the team that you've developed here? Yeah. I mean, I, I'm a real passionate supporter of independent businesses where the owner is an, an involved part of the operation. 
and I've been lucky over the 30 years, or actually it's like 33 years now that I've growing been growing this business, that I've had some real key employees that have been part of it right from the start. Tony, our production manager, he's been with me for more than 30 years. In fact, he started out working for me as a high school kid in the basement when I was just this young kid out of college. And <laughs> oh, um, really? he's, yeah, and he's still here and still plays a real key role in making sure those products get out when they're supposed to get out. And then uh, Bill is a kind of our business manager. He came on board about five or six years after Tony did, but he's been here for a long time. And um, we have a, a, a long-term key core of employees that even though they're not family, we've kind of grown this thing as if we're all owners. Um, we're all getting a little bit older right now. So um, now in order to to kind of figure out how the the business keeps continuing, I do have my children involved, and I've got Brad, who's been hired as well, who I'm kind of considering to be the next layer, the next level of people who are going to come on board. And what's what's beneficial about having my own kids and people like Brad that I can trust as the, as people who are going to take over is that the values that have kind of helped us grow as a, a family business, so to speak. Um, I can be sure that those are going to be continued and try to help continue to um, develop them. Yeah. And they're all a younger generation. Is that something you're, you're looking at making, you know, as, as the business develops, you know, and bringing some of that, those thought processes in and things like that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, Brad is handling the, the technical sales and he's kind of taken over some of the training that I had been doing at trade shows and he's he's doing it in a way that's, even better than what I was able to do because he's getting out there and really getting some experience in the field as well that's beneficial to the training that we do. Uh, Britta, my daughter, is taking over some of the marketing responsibilities, and um, she's valuable to have here because she's aware of some of the newer marketing opportunities and ways to reach an audience that's going to be of that younger generation that we really need to reach now also. Um, my son, Ethan, um, has good experience and a disposition that's really helpful for the accounting and the production. So he's kind of supporting us with the background data that we need to run the company and keep the production going. So I think we do have a, we've got a good team that's going to take over and fill the, the seats that we've had need to fill. Yeah, absolutely. I think what's cool too, is you've seen, I mean, I've called the number before I've seen, seen all of them kind of walk around with headsets on and and just to answering phones when it needs to be. So it really feels like everybody understands that, you know, stuff still has to get done and, you know, it's, everybody's open to contributing. That's pretty cool to see. Yeah. Even though we've grown now, so where everybody kind of has those distinct roles that I talked about, everybody here is a, is a salesperson and a marketer. Everybody's still involved with all those aspects of yeah. the business and understand it. Yeah. And the technical support, people calling in right. for help. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's really cool to see. I mean, have you seen what far as your processes go from, you know, 40 years ago? I'm sure you were taking paper orders and everything to to now. What what's yeah. that transition kind of been like as far as the business side of it? Yeah, we on our tour yesterday, we just did kind of a move into a new office here and as part of that we looked back at some old stuff we had and yeah, <laughs> the the checks used to be written on a carbon check form and the all the accounts were held on cards. Every customer had a card where we kept track of the um, accounts receivable and everything. So that has definitely changed. And that's been something that, for instance, Bill has really helped us transition to a more modern, more modern way of doing it. <laughs> <laughs> and we are, and we're still modernizing and trying to stay ahead of that all the time. Right. So, yeah. You gotta, you gotta adapt, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and the marketing is certainly part of that too. I remember, we used to do lots and lots of trade shows, and then as the internet kind of came out, I thought, oh, you know, this is going to maybe eliminate the need to create a catalog and go to the trade shows and things like that. But as it turns out, that's not the case. I think there's just more opportunities now for communicating, and you really can't um, not pay attention to any of them any longer. They all work together. So I think the the consumer has benefited because there's just a lot more opportunities to get information and we're real big on making sure that information is available and accurate. So. Yeah. You got to put it in, put it out there in all the different channels and yeah, because people learn differently. You yeah. know, some people still learn 
very old school with pen and paper. Some people want, you know, everything on their phones and digital and video and, you know, it's a lot different than it used to be. Yeah. You feel like it's, it's easier now or, or harder? I don't know. I, yeah. I think it's more, you know, the business is more complex just because it's bigger. Mm -hmm. And I, I would say it's um, challenging just because of all of those. Um, you, you have to be aware of all those channels. So it's, it's challenging in its own way. You know, <laughs> I think what, what we end up doing in business, though, is we end, if we're doing well, we want to bring ourselves right to the point where we're challenged and do as much as we can anyway. Mm -hmm. So even though it was simpler back a while ago, I still tried to, you know, work to the point where we were doing the best that we could with what was available. Right. So the, the difficulty is different now. It's, it's more managing a more complex opportunity, but the work is still probably the same level of work. Does right. that make sense? Yeah, for sure. One of the things you said um, in the forum that I really liked was, you know, as the business grows that you're going to be taking on more of a coach role. Um, what, do you, what, do you, what do you mean by that? Well, I guess, you know, it'd be interesting to hear what this, these young people that I've got on board now think <laughs> of my success at doing that. The, the idea is that at some point I've got to step back and not be as involved with the day-to-day -day stuff. And already that's happening because they can do a lot of stuff better than I can. Um, but I want to be able to still have a role where I can add some value, help in ways that, uh, that can keep them going in the right direction. So that's kind of where the coaching comes in. Ideally, that's the, the vision I have of the role I want to play as one that's kind of providing input where it's needed and helpful, but I'm not necessarily the one playing the game because I don't have the energy to do it or the skill that they have now. Sure. Why do you think that's going, Brad? You think he's, he's transferring it over pretty well? Yeah. Yeah, I definitely do. I mean, he's definitely being intentional about doing that. And uh, there's definitely times when he's hanging on to some things, you know, but he's pushing us to make changes and keep moving forward. So definitely more encouragement than there is hanging on to things. So I think he's done a pretty good job at it. Yeah. That's pretty difficult to, to give up things, you know, in any role. And I think, you know, as a, as you transfer pieces, you just have to accept that and hopefully you've trained them and well enough to take it over and not crash and burn it. <laughs> yeah, <that's... laughs> but it's difficult to, you know, things that you've held on for a long time to, to give them up or, you know, for the better of the company. It's, yeah. That's good of you. I and mean, it's diff definitely difficult it's, to do. Yeah. It's hard to do it. I, I expect we're going to continue to have difficulties doing it because yeah. there's that fine line between just different and not as good. And, yeah. and when you're judging those from a subjective point of view, yeah, yeah, you're not always exactly right on in an objective um, judgment of it. Yeah. So, sure. Yeah. How have you had um, some tough conversations throughout that time of, you know, because it is a different world now and just kind of you've got the younger input and you guys have some good conversations back and forth, I'm sure, about, you know, where the business is going or what to do, what not to do, things like that. Yeah. Yeah, I think we, I think we, have a pretty good open rapport here. So I think we do talk about it quite a bit. And I think we, we're to the point where we all kind of know where somebody is going to come down on some particular um, topic that we're debating or, or discussing. Um, but I think it's open enough that we're continuing to have those conversations. And while there's little friction every once in a while, I think we're getting past it. I, yeah, I think instead of tough, I think they're healthy. We just yeah. we're real intentional about getting the issues out and talking those through, and that's where they become tough because issues are issues. Mm -hmm. But um, but overall, I think it's a real healthy way we we go about it. Yeah. How often do you guys hold meetings? Well, we're we're we've gotten in the 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 goal now anyway of a weekly we call it an ELT an executive leadership team meeting mm -hmm. and then we have a weekly production meeting also and we have a marketing meeting that we try to do weekly as well um, but that's been something we've instituted really just in the last two years when we've mm -hmm. kind of added more employees sure and we've kind of based it off of an an EOS system which mm -hmm. is kind of a popular system that's understood out there and we've we've modified it a little bit because there's things that that work and things that we found don't work, but we really like the idea of keeping track of kind of the small to do's and the bigger tasks mm -hmm. that are long term and kind of plotting with a scorecard to mm -hmm. see how we're doing as we track towards those goals. 
Yeah. Good old Gino Wickman. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I love, yeah. I love the traction stuff. Yeah. That's cool. Well, thanks for sharing all that. The history is pretty awesome. I mean, we didn't get crazy into it, but you know, it's it's fun to see a company survive that long and and thrive that long. You know, and it's yeah. make the transition and pivot, and it's really cool. So thanks for thanks for sharing the story. Well, good, thanks, um, Brad. So how how did you get involved in the business, and you know what what do you kind of what's your main roles around here? Sure. Yeah, I guess we all fall into the pool industry one way or another. But for me, <laughs> <laughs> literally sometimes yeah, fall in. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> Yeah, for me, I had a pool and I was kind of just starting out real younger in life. And that pool had a propensity to leak a lot. So I was always battling a leak and I'm kind of a do-it-yourselfer, figure-it-out kind of person and wanted to solve those problems myself. And I bumped into Lance up here in Minnesota and uh, asked him what he did. He said, well, I work for a company that manufactures equipment that finds leaks in swimming pools. And I thought... <laughs> Wow. Light bulb. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's not something you hear every day, but I have a leak in my pool, so uh, why don't you come on over and help me out? <laughs> so he did. He came over, and, you know, I had, through my process, I had my own way of kind of narrowing down where the leaks might be. And Oh, yeah. Um, Talk about that. What did you do to find that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I call it the leaf locator. Yeah, we go. were. We had a leak in my pool, and I was watching it go down a little bit, three quarters of an inch every day. And I finally, I couldn't find it. I was getting frustrated. I kicked a bunch of leaves in the pool, and then it started going down only about a quarter inch a day. So I thought, oh, one of those leaves plugged the hole, and I swam around and moved the leaves. And sure enough, I found the leak with the, the <laughs> hole. So I haven't patented All the leaf technology. locator yet, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, so... But yeah, That's that awesome. was kind of started a conversation at least between us and um you did end up getting offering me a job down the road. So Yeah. When you kinda you say you show you kinda balanced that with being a youth pastor and kind of getting into the industries. So. Yeah, I did. Um interesting enough, he kinda offered that job to me right as I was taking a position at my church and uh so I said, oh, I gotta I gotta see this responsibility through. I'd kinda committed to that and it was a time in my church where they kinda needed somebody, so I stepped in there, and then when I was done serving there, I actually got Lance a little bit involved in that, and he helped a little there too. But um, And I was done with that. I called him up again and said, hey, remember when we talked about that job? Any chance there's still something there? He said, you know, we might be able to work something out. So um, ended up, yeah, starting here. And So what'd you, what, would, what was the first stuff you started to learn when you came on here? Were you doing plugs or what would you start? Yep. First thing they had me do was make plugs like he did when he was a kid growing up. And and in fact, I they needed me at the busy season to literally make stuff, you know. And uh, so I got in and just started making stuff and uh, learning the products by putting them together, learning the leak tracks by uh, repairing them, things like that. So I got a real understanding for how the equipment works and how the equipment's made and uh, what its uses are. So... And then after that, they started, you know, getting me a little bit more involved with talking on the phone and hearing from the customers, taking orders, things like that, and uh, eventually gave me the leak detection training that he gives the other people at the trade shows and uh, sent me out in the field to see if it would work or not work and started doing some leak detection then. And I have to jump in here a little bit if that's all right, because, yeah. you know, I didn't just hire him because I saw this leaf detector that he had, <laughs> he had established. There was a little more to the story. Sure. I mean, I, we, uh, I had observed him as a youth pastor at church. And in fact, he was Ethan's youth pastor. So I, I came to see that he could, he could teach and he could be articulate and put some difficult concepts out there and teach them to a, a classroom of high school or junior high kids. And I also knew that he had had a business of his own that he had operated basically out of a pickup truck, so to speak, like a lot of our customers end up doing. So I thought, you know, this is a guy who can relate to the people that we sell to. And um, I think he could be well-trained and a, and a real asset to our team. So Yeah, and communicate well. And communicate yeah, well, that's a, yeah. That's yeah. a big thing you can see from yeah. from being able to speak on a stage, for sure. <laughs> yeah, right. Sure. That's cool. So how the leak detection go when you first got out there you just kind of started it yeah and it's interesting <laughs> i mean obviously i had all the right tools working for anderson so i had the tools down but um 
also just being willing to kind of take the job on. I had a little bit of a chip on my shoulder that I was going to find everything. So between the tools that I had and the training that I had gotten, I was able to be effective from the beginning. I mean, I found all the leaks and then through getting out there and doing it, I've become much more efficient and quicker and better and things like that. So, yeah, we talked yesterday a little bit about that, about that mentality of, I'm going to find it no matter what. And you kind of have to have that a little bit when you're yeah. trying to find leaks, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, a lot of them you're going to find quickly or just through the process and the equipment, but there are some that throw you for a loop here or there. And when that happens, you got to be resilient and, and really want to find it. And part of that is we talked too about how it's a mentally rewarding thing doing leaks. And I've definitely found that as I've been out and working on the harder they are, the better you feel when you do figure them out. And uh, it's not just about punching the clock sometimes, it's about I'm going to find this and figure it out and solve the problem. So Yeah, that's definitely cool. And you, and you can, when you uh, see that customer's face and you fix their problem, that's a, that's a pretty cool thing. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it feels good. So some pool companies may see, you know, a leak in a pool as a big headache and, after spending time with you guys, um, we know it's important that you want to teach them that those leaks can be potential opportunities, you know, instead of headaches. Can you can you talk more about that? Yeah, I I, I frequently use uh, something I learned, and that is that in the Chinese language, apparently the word, same word for tragedy is used for opportunity also. And so I think that really is a a good way of describing what leaks are. And you're right. In the pool industry, they've frequently been, been looked upon as a headache because if you don't know how to find that leak, it ends up being wasted time. And if you can't find it for your customer, it ends up being a loss of con confidence on their part. It can cause a great deal of frustration, which means that you're taking productive time away from other work that you're doing as well. I mean, ultimately, a, a leak can be a profit-losing scenario for some companies rather than a profit making one and it's certainly a headache for customers as well for the people who have a pool this this concept of their pool water being lost and not knowing where it is can be really stressful but those same reasons are why it has been identified as a real opportunity for uh for some in the industry as well and that is that because it's perceived to be so difficult to do, it generally generates higher service rates than what a regular service route would generate or regular service work. Um, it's also a, basically a paid sales call. You're going out there and you're being paid to diagnose a problem at the pool, which as a pool professional, you should have the fix for as well. Maybe it's a replacement liner or maybe it's just a patch, but it might be a complete renovation or an opportunity to really sell a, a, a bigger construction job. Um, Brad mentioned it's mentally rewarding. I think it also kind of establishes you as a hero, so to speak, when you can find that leak. So it's, it's definitely an opportunity as well. The real key is just knowing how to turn it into something you can do efficiently. I definitely know yesterday in the training, I, I'd be like, Oh, I found a leak, you know, <laughs> even in just the testing that you had set up, there is this kind of like happiness, even, even though we weren't doing it for a customer. It was still that like, oh, I found it. I figured out the puzzle. Like there's this little, sure. you know, here's the beginning, here's the end. And somewhere in the middle, I've got to make the connection. Yeah. You yep. know, where is the leak? Whether or not we were using, you know, the listening device or we were using, you know, with the pressure set up or we were using, you know, the leak track. It was just really neat to go, oh, well, there is a way to do this and not just a headache. Sure. Yep. That's the key. And we really try to teach that there's an efficient way of doing it. If you kind of are diligent in going through a process of elimination and utilizing a procedure for collecting information and turning it into the solution, it can be done efficiently by anybody with some pretty basic yeah. knowledge. Yeah. I've noticed too, customers just have a increased amount of stress with a leak problem. And I think it's whether it's having to repair their whole pool or just where's that water going they always ask me where's all that water going you know and so i think they have an elevated amount of stress so when you do solve that leak specific problem you do become a little bit more of a hero or an expert than um, than a normal maybe pump seal or something like that but. our passion to seek pool industry knowledge and being able to share that knowledge with you is the reason we started pool chasers Turns out Pentair has several ways for you to gain knowledge as well. 
Take, for example, the Pentair Master Service Program. This is a program designed to recognize dealers, service technicians, and other pool professionals for completing desired training modules. It gives you the tools you can use to troubleshoot Pentair installations in the field and become a master of Pentair product knowledge. Be rewarded for educational activities designed to enhance your Pentair knowledge as you move through the certification levels. With three levels to work through, becoming a certified Pentair professional has never been easier. It's training that rewards you and your business. But the real value comes from building your confidence in the field to ensure the customer loyalty you need to keep your business growing. We encourage you to check this out. So to become a certified Pentair professional today, visit PentairPartners.com or click the link in the write-up below. Cool. So now that we've we've kind of learned more about that and you guys, I think you're definitely hitting on a lot of awesome points there with the customer. We've had a lot of, you know, requests for leak detection episodes. So I want to get into some more of the technical aspects of it. When you're looking for a leak, what are some of the symptoms or signs that the pool may be leaking? You know, a leak is uh, going to cause a symptom either because something's being lost from the pool or something's being pulled in through a hole. And that what's being pulled in would be the result of like a leak in a suction side plumbing or something like that. And that's going to result in a symptom of air being pulled into the pump or blown into the pool. So sometimes if you're out doing your service routes and you see air being blown into the pool, a, a likely symptom or a possible reason for that is that there is actually a leak in the suction side plumbing. Um, more frequently, the problems are related to water loss going out of the system. And those will either be really obvious by watching the water level go down if there's not an automatic fill device. But I know you guys are down from Arizona where there's lots of automatic <laughs> fill devices. So sure. in those cases, the symptoms you're looking for have more to do with treating the water that's being lost from that's being added to the system to replace that lost water. And that has a lot to do with the fact that the water you're losing has the chemicals in it. So as new water is put in, new chemicals have to be put in. So you're you're watching for things where pools that require more chemicals than other pools or have algae growth that's more of a problem than others. Any indication that that chemical balance is getting out of whack can be a a cause for suspecting that there's a leak in that pool. That's a uh, man. I was. I said yes. I, I've ran. The, I did that for six years and never once thought of that for some reason. Of you know, this pool is taking way more chemicals than it should. Kind of just chalked it up to being hot or in the summer. You know, in Arizona, but like that's a real legitimate reason would be that the chemicals are leaking out and the new water's being added, so it's diluting those. That's pretty. That's pretty cool to. To understand, because I, I I didn't until yesterday going through that I did not put those two things together. So yeah. that's cool. Good. Yeah, that's a good way to determine if it's or help determine at least if it's evaporation or a leak as well, because the chemicals aren't going to evaporate out of the pool. So if right. you're adding water, it kind of brings that back in if it's evaporation. But right. If the leak, if it's going out that way, the chemicals leak right out with it. So, so you touched touched on evaporation. You know, how would you know it's not evaporation besides what you you said there? Yeah, I mean, evaporation is a way that water gets pulled out or lost from the pool. So, as a pool guy, we want to understand what evaporation is and how that works. And it's interesting. It's actually fairly complex. There's a lot of different factors. You know, water temperature, air temperature, wind movement, pool movement. All those things are going to play a role in what the evaporation has done. So it is kind of tough to say, hey, it's a quarter inch a day or it's an inch a week or whatever it might be. I mean, you might have some of those rules of thumbs, but just know that evaporation is going to be vastly different from region to region, uh, neighborhood to neighborhood, even pool to pool in the same neighborhood, and same with the same pool day to day. So it's a lot of different factors uh, that evaporation is going to depend on. So... Um, being able to communicate with your customer on what evaporation is is kind of a good thing. We do have an evaporation index on our website where you can put in your zip code and it'll make that evaporation rate region specific because of the weather and then answer three questions about the pool, which makes it pool specific. So you can get a number that would be accurate for that day or that weather. Um, so that's a good resource that you can use. And once you start running that, maybe on five or ten pools, you kind of get a feel for what the evaporation rate might be normally, and then you can go back to that 
index and if it's really windy or really hot or dry or something like that just to get a reset but, and you if the pool is warmer and it's colder outside you'll see more evaporation right yep that's a big one so definitely in the fall when stuff starts to cool down and you've got warmer pools and then colder air you're going to see more evaporation or if you get a real hot day in arizona and cool nights you're going to see evaporation so, more at night though right not the heat during, that, that was something we yeah. said yesterday I, did, I learned is that you know if just because we're in hot arizona doesn't mean that it evaporates faster it's got to be different elements yeah yeah so evaporation is essentially energy or heat that's moving out of the pool so it's rising up and when those water molecules turn into vapor water vapor. water vapor yeah when they do that they create kind of a blanket that's over the top of the uh, pool and then when the that'll slow some of the evaporation just like if you put a blanket onto your body it would keep you warmer but then when the wind comes up it takes that water vapor and blows it away it draws more energy or more heat out of the pool so wind is a really big factor in evaporation as well when the water's hot and it's hot outside you, you probably won't see a whole lot right yeah no, yep and if the water's cooler than the air you're not going to see hardly any wow so. that's cool and it's interesting that you're talking about seeing it because sometimes you actually can see the evaporation mm -hmm. when the the pool is really warm and the air is really cold you actually yeah. see that vapor going off and um so that's, that's not just that's steam happened. that's well it is steam <laughs> it, part is, of it. it is steam it's evaporation it's just what's happening all the time it's just that it may not be happening at the same rate mm. where you can actually see it that's just an accelerated that's an accelerated time yeah oh. that's cool yeah it's it's important to understand the differences for sure um that way you can communicate it you know to your yeah. customer and figure out you know if it's losing water more rapidly than it should you know um, while we were running brothers, you know, once we determined that a pool had a leak, we'd usually hand it off to a specialist, you know, that would take over there for this scenario. Let's say you're the specialist, Brad, and where would you start looking for the leak and what would be your progression through that? Sure. Yeah. Generally when I get to the pool, one of the first things I do is set up my leakalyzer, which is our rapid water loss sensor. And that just gives me information about what's going on in the pool. But for the most part, when I get there, I'm I'm checking common areas. I'm being very observant when I get to the pool. It's a little bit of a mind shift where I'm not just going there to, you know, put chemicals in the pool. I'm going there to solve a problem. So everything's important. I can look at looking for signs of deck settling, looking for some of those symptoms that Lance talked about um, to confirm that there's a leak. But I'm checking the equipment a lot of times right away just to see if there's any leaks or water coming out at the equipment. And then I'm working through the common spots. You know, I'm quickly checking the skimmers, uh, maybe some fittings, things like that. Just uh, looking for something obvious at this point. I don't want to necessarily get out all my equipment and get real deep into a leak detection job if there's something obvious going on. So I do kind of an information gathering assessment of the pool where I'm checking some common spots and I'm, I'm looking for something that might be obvious and moving forward from there so um, but once that initial walkthrough is kind of completed then I start to move from looking for something obvious to really being a little bit more systematical about it and I'm starting to break down the pool into different sections and isolate those specific areas and at that point I might for instance take a skimmer and isolate just that skimmer and I'm going to work at it with the dye test and see if I find any leaks there or if I don't then I'd eliminate that from the process. So um want to do that in a way where I'm I'm being thorough and being um I guess yeah, complete. Yeah, mm -hmm. complete so that I don't have to worry about going back. I just know that that's done and then I'll move to another section or move to another section, isolate the light or the plumbing, things like that. What are the what are the most common areas you run dye tests on besides the skimmer? Yeah, I mean skimmers a a big one. I'll test all the fittings. I kind of do a dye testing lap around the pool where I'm checking everything I can reach from the top before I'd have to dive into the pool. And I'm using a mirror, um, just a little cheap mirror to see around the fittings and things like that. But um, a dye test is a pretty effective way to find a tool. I mean, or find a leak. I've got all sorts of equipment in my truck. And I find a lot of leaks just with a dye tester. Um, but you're basically putting a little bit of dye, testing a suspect area, coloring that water, and if that water gets 
pulled through into that what looks like a leak, then that's you you've confirmed it. You found the leak. So is that um with a pump on or off when you're doing that? Uh pump would be off for the dye testing. Yeah. So that you can see water moving in its natural state more than being moved by equipment. Yeah. Yeah. And when you're doing a dye test, you're really putting just a small amount of dye within a like a quarter of an inch of where you suspect a leak might be. So when Brad's talking about looking at these suspect areas, what we're talking about is anything we can visually see that might be a potential leak. And those would be like cracks in a gunite pool or any place where there are penetrations through the pool wall uh, because of return fittings or skimmers, any place where there's multiple materials being bonded together as part of the pool construction process. Those are suspect areas that you'd want to really carefully just put this die within a quarter of an inch of the seams and the cracks that you're seeing to see if it gets pulled out of the pool. It's pretty basic and simple, but there's nothing that really um, does better than doing a good, complete, diligent job of checking those areas visually. Is a die tester is something you guys adapted, obviously, right? So you were doing the plugs and stuff. So what? How'd you figure out that that worked? You know, I think that's been something that has been known by people in the industry for a long time. For a long time, it was a test reagent. Just the, okay. the phenol red was used mm -hmm. as the dye, and then some smart somebody decided that a syringe was nice because every time you let go of the test reagent bottle, you didn't suck dye or water in to dilute oh, okay. your dye. So the syringe is a nice way of doing it, and then we add a long um, nozzle on it so you can keep your hand a long way from where the testing is being done. So you're done. not moving the, moving the dye with your hand? Not creating currents, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. So after the dye test, what's what's next? If you if that doesn't <laughs> find yeah. it for you. <laughs> yeah. And it's interesting. It's kind of a logical progression of problem solving. So you might, in your initial assessment, you might gather some information that causes you to go one way or another. Um, but one of the things that I like to do is kind of divide it up between the pool shell and the pool plumbing. Mm. And when uh, I've kind of done my dye testing lap where I might find something early on, if I don't, I'll probably move to a, a pressure test. Or um, we've also got these dye testing cones where you can quickly determine if it's a pipe leak or not a pipe leak. Um, but once... Uh, You've done that. If you do have a suspect pipe, you'd run a pressure test um, to see if that pipe is good or bad. And uh, if it is, if it does fail, then the pressure test, it's losing pressure, then we'd work on a sonic leak detection method. Um, so it, would you use the cone, you know, with a die to figure out that line is suspect to yep. test it? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So and it's part of my dye testing lap. I usually test the plumbing as I go around mm -hmm. and uh, that dye testing cone basically reduces the size of that plug just down to one little tube. So if water is leaking back there, we put that dye in the tube, it gets drawn in and it tells us, yeah, there's a leak in that pipe. And then we kind of go figure out where it is and run the pressure tests and things nice. like that. So. What's 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 pressure testing that people may not know, and how do you kind of yeah. what's a basic overview of it? Yeah. Well, the nice part about pressure testing is that it's it's a guarantee that the lines are good, and uh, I really enjoyed pressure testing, especially when I got started, because it's valuable information that puts the homeowners at ease. You mm. know, if you can tell them, hey, all your plumbing lines are good, a weight goes off their shoulders. So, and it's definitive. If it holds pressure, your lines are good. So. It might be hard to find some leaks sometimes, but if you've run a pressure test and that's all good, you've eliminated that as being a problem. So you're basically plugging up both ends of the line, and uh, you might put plugs in the skimmer, for instance, and then put a plug in the pump, and you'd induce pressure into those lines and then block it off. If it holds that pressure, the lines are good. If that pressure drops you know, from maybe 15 PSI down all the way to zero, then you're looking at a leak. So how much pressure are you putting in those generally? Uh, we, yeah, generally I'm between 10 and 15 pounds. Um, we kind of say no higher than 20 pounds of pressure. So, And are you using water with that or just air? We're using water, and uh, that's one of the, the confusions that's out there in the industry. Um, if we pressure test with air or with water, and that's something we go through in our training and talk about how air and water react in a line and things like that but ultimately 
we're using water. We want a pipe completely filled with water for our pressure test. We'll see faster pressure drops and it's a safer procedure. So it's, yeah, it's, a, it's water for a pressure test that's used to determine if the line is leaking or you're just looking to see if there's a drop in pressure. And the confusion comes in because air is what we need to make a noise to pinpoint a leak in that plumbing line, which is also sometimes considered a pressure test. But we kind of like to differentiate the pressure test that's used for isolating the line, which is a, is it leaking or not? And that's where you'd use water because you see a quick drop in pressure from the pressure test that's used to pinpoint where the leak is, which is where you use air and the purpose is to make a noise underground that you can pick up. Mm -hmm. Doing that, you're, you're saturating the ground underneath it, right? And the air is causing those, those noises. Yep. Yeah, yep. you're trying to get air to escape from the pipe into water-saturated soil, and that makes a bubbling, gurgling sound. And in, in the training, we we talk a lot, and we also have some models set up so you can see, and you guys saw this yesterday, how that air and water actually behave, and how you, you can be assured that you're making a noise when you want to make a noise by understanding how the air and the water behave differently in that plumbing line. Mm -hmm. And water stays in the bottom, air on top, right? Yep, that's... One of the basic rules. Yeah. Yep, that's it. It's no no different than what you see in your glass of water. Yeah. The pipes don't behave any differently than the pool or your glass. So nice. So what's after pressure testing? Oh, uh, well, pressure testing. It depends if that. Let's say that holds pressure, right? Then we the lines are all good. Then then we're down to just the shell. And at that point, it depends a little bit on what type of pool we're dealing with. But uh, if it's a liner pool, for instance, we've got the leak track. 2400 which puts an electrical charge into the pool and that liner is electrical insulating so that charge works to ground itself and will actually ground itself through the hole in the liner um, which is an awesome tool i wish we had one that worked for concrete pools as well but sometimes <laughs> people say hey could you just make a tool that says exactly where the leak is and that's the leak track 2400 it does work that well so which is nice vinyl liners have a propensity to leak a little bit more often so um, so that's sending a small electrical current through the water and where it's breaking the loop is where you'd find the leak. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty and, much. Yeah. It's got a probe on the end of a pool pole that we can move in and see both which direction the current is flowing and then also measures the intensity of the current. So, um, it gets a lot more intense right at the, the leak. So. I thought that was kind of fun. That was kind of like operating a metal detector you know like you're sweeping the pool and you might hear a little noise and depending on where you are in the pool it'll get louder or quieter and it's getting you closer and closer as you get to the leak it's getting louder and louder and yeah. higher pitched and you're like oh i think i found it yeah. and then you'll move past it and it'll go away and you're like oh nope and you kind of have to turn it certain ways and get it and then all of a sudden you're like, oh, and when you found it, you you know you found it. Yeah. it there's no like, oh, it might be here. It yeah. You definitely know you found it with that tool. Yeah. And yeah, liners have gotten so much more complex in their patterns. And there's a couple liners out there when I the leak track is pointing right to them and I still can hardly see it. And then it finally jumps out. Oh, there it is. But there's like almost leak slits built into some of these these patterns so that... The leak track has really become a necessity for vinyl liner leak detection. Not only is it fast, but man, you can't see them without that leak track. So that's a, a benefit for the leak detectors or the pool companies that are out there because, um, you know, it does make it easy to find those leaks and they happen a fair amount. So up here in the northern part of the United States, we've got a lot more vinyl liner pools. And, and I, I think, Brad, that, you know, from a percentage standpoint, because we're up in this vinyl liner country, vinyl liner leaks end up being a pretty big percentage of the leaks that we yeah. deal with up here. We yeah. still have to be able to, to pressure test and die test and dive, but we are able to solve a lot of problems with that leak track. Yeah. And it's it's really a, a brilliant idea that actually the way that device came up uh, or, or became known to us was there was a guy out in Connecticut who was a retired electrical engineer and about 20 some years ago he had a leak in his pool and he went out to Radio Shack and Radio Shack's no longer around anymore but he purchased a whole bunch of uh, electrical components and put them together into the first 
leak track that existed and figured out how to find a leak in his vinyl liner pool. And he ended up having a buddy that he had worked with through his career who said, you know, that's a, that's a really good product that somebody would be interested in. And it was early in Anderson Manufacturing Company's genesis or life, but we had established ourselves in the swimming pool industry as somebody who kind of had these leak products. So we were approached by this guy's friend, and um, he said, do you think this has any any value here in your industry? And we said, yeah, it does. We'd like to help you <laughs> <laughs> sell it. And yeah. so we helped him get it patented in his name, and we paid him royalties for a long time. So this retired electrical engineer had a pretty nice retirement for the next 10 or 15 years because he was receiving royalties from this product that really solved a real problem in the industry. Right. And it, it amazes me that people's people's brains can come up with that stuff and <laughs> inventors and just how you just figure out these components that do that. It's that's pretty yeah. awesome to to see the human nature in, in people like that. It is. <laughs> and and the and the need we have for so many different types of knowledge from so many different people. Yeah. How important it is to be able to really work together in a trusting way so that you can bring those things and then kind of improve our whole industry or our society with the delivery of them. So. Yeah. So if you find a leak in a vinyl liner, what's, what's kind of, how do you, how do you fix those? Yeah. And I kind of like the vinyl liner the line. leaks. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, one thing that's great about liner leaks is they're easy to find with the leak track and they're easy to patch and the customer is happy when you're done. So I generally, I, I'm just running a vinyl patch. I'm cutting that out and, and gluing that on to the, the leak itself so we've got some clear vinyl stick patches but uh for the most part i'm putting uh one that matches the pattern of the liner on. oh you can like get get one that matches yeah yeah with all the craziness so, yeah <laughs> yeah so how do you get those through the manufacturer or something yeah the manufacturer makes like the samples that okay. people look through to pick out mm. which one they want so i just grab a few of those from the pool companies and cut those out then to match the ones that people bought oh that's pretty cool yeah, <laughs> yeah. what's that process so, look like you just you patch in a patch in a hole yeah so you once you find it you know you cut out a nice round patch so you don't want corners that can peel up things like that and we've got a glue that works underwater so we take them down and clean the area first and then put that vinyl patch with glue on and squeegee it on so it sticks nice and nice and tight hmm. Very cool. Yeah. <laughs> so if there, if you're doing that and you you don't find the leak in the liner, I mean, or maybe that's it for liners. What's yeah, what about that's kind of other... it for liners. But for gunite or concrete pools, you know, one of the tools that we have is a hydrophone, which is a microphone that goes into the water where you can actually <laughs> hear the water escaping out of a leak. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's one of those tools. It's almost like an electronic dye test where you can. You're going to get it close and test suspect areas just like you would die. But uh, something we call is a little bit of a cheater tool because it's a real fast way to go around the pool. And if we hear something, then we're going to jump to that area and confirm it with a dye test. And then we might be done with the pool job because we heard something. And, and that happens a fair amount in the gunite pools. Now, when we start talking about... Uh, like locating or eliminating a section. We don't necessarily use the hydrophone for eliminating a section from the pool. We almost more just use it as a, like I said, a cheater tool that that guides you to where the leak might be. So, what are what sound are you listening for? Uh, it's just like a, almost a static sound or a jet engine sound. People have described it as. It's like a. Ch and then as you get closer to it, it gets louder and further, it gets farther away. So it's like a, mm. something like that. So you're looking for differences in the sound. That was, that, that was right on point. That's, <laughs> that's pretty much exactly what it sounds like. <laughs> Brad, the leak impersonator. Yeah, there you go. I think we have a leak here. <laughs> sounds like you've heard it once or twice. Yeah, been there, done that. Yeah. Yeah. So. That's awesome. Well, you mentioned the leakalyzer in the beginning. What what does that do? Yeah, the leakalyzer is our rapid water loss sensor. And uh, essentially what it's doing is measuring the water level very precisely down to the 10,000th of an inch, which allows us to get fast results. So 
what we might do with a bucket test where we're measuring the water loss over 24 hours, we can do in more like 10 to 15 minutes. So like I mentioned, it's something I put right on the pool when I get there. And then as I'm doing my initial assessment, looking at common areas, maybe talking with the customer about what's going on, I'm getting a real time measurement of what the pool water level is doing. And that helps mainly in two spots, but the first one is just to confirm that there is a leak so that I don't have to look for something that's not there. And it also gives me then a, a value to how much water is being lost. So I know, am I looking for you know, a quarter inch a day? That's going to be real small. Or am I looking for a, an inch and a half a day? That should be something I can find pretty so quick. Are you doing that with the pump on or the pump off? Interesting. I do it however the pool is when I get there. So if the pool is running when I get there, I like to run the first leakalyzer test with the pump on. And then generally I'll shut the pump off to do my dye testing or listening with the hydrophone. And then I'll run another test with the pump off while I'm doing my other things. So it continues to give me information um, as I'm doing my leak job. So, so you could potentially find a leak while the system's on, but when the system's off, it doesn't leak at all or vice versa. Yeah. Yeah. So you can run pump on versus pump off comparisons. And if you're experiencing a lot of water loss with the pump on, but then you turn the pump off and you're not losing as much water, we're going to suspect the leaks probably in the pressure side plumbing because that pump is pushing water out of the leak. Whereas maybe we might find that when the pump turns off we actually lose more water than when the pump was on and in that case we're probably going to suspect something in the suction side plumbing because instead of pushing water out of the leak we might actually be pulling air in through that leak and then when we turn the pump off the water does leak out there more so if we see it that's the same pump on versus pump off test then we're thinking it's probably somewhere in the shell not in the plumbing so and there's there's a few caveats to that but that's a pretty good rule that we can suspect pressure side versus uh, suction side plumbing based on the pump on pump off test so i thought there was something else interesting too yesterday you were saying uh with the pump off pump on that sometimes you'll see the water level actually go up sure yeah, so we get this call with the leakalyzer sometimes where we'll get a call and someone will say, hey, you know, the, my pool is going up and it's not raining. I don't have a hose in the pool. What's going on? And generally what happened was they had just shut the pool pump off and there's some type of air leak maybe up in the equipment and that water from the filter is draining back into the pool actually causing it to go up. And then they'll see once that filter gets drained out, it'll level off and then start coming down either with the leak rate or the evaporation rate. So that's what we found about the, the leak laser. It's a, been a product that we've had out now for probably close to 10 years. And initially we thought it was its main purpose was just going to be <clears throat> to figure out if the pool was leaking and then if a leak had been fixed afterwards. But mm -hmm. We're finding, actually, as we start to hear from people some of the confusion they have with using it, that that confusion can be turned around and it becomes information that's really helpful for diagnosing where the problem is. So like that that problem of seeing the, the water level rising, initially we thought, oh, what a, what a bummer. And in fact, when I was first testing the device, I'd bring it home to my pool every day, and that was happening to me. I'd get it set up in my pool, and every time it was showing me a rise on the device. Hmm. And I thought, God darn it, we got to get this bug fixed. <laughs> but I, I soon figured out that what I was doing is I wasn't doing what Brad said he does when he gets to a pool. When I was getting to my pool, I was wanting things to be nice and still. So I turned the pump off as soon as I got there. Mm -hmm. And then I'd set the leakalyzer up. And so what was happening was the water was rising because I had a leak up in the plumbing above the water level of the pool. Mm -hmm. So had I... Had I been a little bit more aware of that at the start, which is kind of knowledge, a knowledge base we've gained as more and more people have been using this device, we figured out that that's actually a, not a problem. It's a diagnostic uh, pattern that mm -hmm. we now use to help us find where the problem is. Yeah, yeah. that's pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's a fun, <laughs> awesome tool. I, I use it a lot to eliminate a whole bunch of sections as not leaking or call them leak free. So I might find something in my initial assessment and that skimmer perhaps with the dye test, I can patch that quickly, run a leakalyzer test that I maybe my first test was 
losing an inch a day, and then I patch that leak, and now I'm not losing anything on my leakalyzer, I know the rest of the pool is not leaking anymore. So I've virtually eliminated any type of callback from multiple leak situations or anything like that. So I might find that it goes from one inch a day to half an inch a day, which is great. I solved some problem, but I still got more to find, and then I'll find that one so I don't get the callback right. next week. And it's measuring that water at a very fine rate. Like what you said yesterday compared to a piece of paper, how, yeah. how is it? Yeah, it's measuring to about the 10,000th of an inch. So one one hundredth the thickness of a sheet of paper. So you might see on your legalizer, the number might be to 100 after about 10 or 15 minutes. And that would be a leak situation, but it's really only lost the thickness of a sheet of paper. Wow. So, that's yeah. crazy. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> that's really cool. Um, so if you find, let's go back to the, the, the plumbing lines. If you find a leak in the plumbing, you guys have some electronic listing devices to kind of help find those spots. Can you talk about that process a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. So we, we have the listening devices then that you can hone in and figure out exactly where that air that we're inducing is escaping out of the leak, making that bubble gurgle noise. So we're listening for that leak noise, but it's a leak that we're creating by inducing that air pressure. So when we hear that bubble gurgle noise, we use the listening device to hear that, but to kind of move around the surface to see where that noise is the loudest and where it's also the most crisp and uh, distinct. So that'll be where we end up putting an X on the deck or where we end up cutting through the deck to make the repair. And, and you're you're creating the noise, and, and that really is almost like a metal detector. You're sticking it to the ground, moving it along, yeah. uh, but you're looking for those those d distinct sounds, right? Yep. Yeah, and so definitely when people call with questions on that, generally the toughest part of it is comes from two areas. One is not making the right noise, and we want to work hard with that. We do that at training here, how to make that right noise, to make sure air is escaping into water-saturated soil. And uh, we can control the air pressure and things like that to make sure the the noise is nice, bubbly, good noise. Uh, but then the second reason people will call, they have maybe hear it in a big, wide area, and you've got maybe a 12-foot circle where you're hearing this noise, and you only want to cut a two-foot hole. So how do we get down right on top of the leak and know we're in the right spot? And that's where the listing devices that we have really come into play. They're, they're pretty sophisticated in how they work. They can do high frequency filtering and low frequency filtering where we can hone in on a specific frequency and when a leak noise is made it's made in a, all the different frequencies but how those high sounds and how those low sounds travel is a little bit different and we can use that to our advantage in honing in right where the leak detection or right where the leak spot is yeah you can really hear the difference in the filters you know the, with the the real bass sound, dark, you know, or the high pitch sounds you can change and yeah. that really helps find stuff. Yeah. Although you tricked us and, you know, <laughs> we didn't find the second one. Yeah. <laughs> Keep that quiet. Yeah. 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 So. You're close. Yeah. You're close. <laughs> kind of. Yeah. So I mean, really, you know, you guys have all kinds of tools, but it's really like finding the right tool for specific jobs and, and regions, right? Yeah. Yeah. And in fact, we, we kind of joke about, the tool is not the leak detector, right? The leak detector, the person is the leak detector. And that person then is in charge of choosing which tool to use in which situation and things like that. And there's no tool that's going to replace that person. That person needs to be the problem solver and has a lot of the different tools at his, his or her disposal. So, Right. Well, it's that time of year again. Poolerex is having their spring big sale event. That means it is time for you to stock up for the summer. When we were running Brothers, this was one of our favorite times of the year. We got a discount on the product, but more importantly, we were setting our pools up to be successful and reducing chemical usage, which saved us a ton of time and money. Let me tell you a little bit more about the product. PoolRx eliminates and prevents all types of algae, reduces chlorine demand, and lasts up to six months. With PoolRx, there is no need for phosphate removers, clarifiers, or other algicides. While using PoolRx, you will see high-definition water clarity. I mean, these pools just pop. Right now, you can get $15 off a 4-pack of blue units and $17.50 off a 4-pack of black units at your favorite distribution location. The sale ends April 30th, so get them while you can. 
If you want to find out more about the product and how we use it for our company, please go listen to episode eight of the podcast. And you can also visit polarx.com by clicking the link below. So as far as the training goes, which like we took yesterday, we know that's something that you have started offering that's kind of newer. Can you talk about why you wanted to give companies that option? I think the training came in because we we had been pretty experienced and practiced at giving seminars at trade shows, um, but that was limited to like a one and a one and a half hour time slot, uh, or in some cases we got up to three hours. But still, it it was a limited time to really give people all that information, and which can be really hard if they're trying to ask questions in between and yeah. put it in between to an hour and a half. Yeah, and there's there's also a real benefit to getting some hands on experience, and right. I think that's really kind of the. The demand, I talked earlier about having big ears. We just started listening and not being able to not hear the fact that people wanted more of an experience to actually get some hands-on training in addition to the, the classroom stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so Brad getting out in the field has helped us really collect some information that's been helpful to put together into a presentation that we can give in the classroom. And then we've also added a whole area in our warehouse where we've buried pipes and we've got a pool that you can... Uh, try the leak track in and take a look at how air and water behave in a clear piece of PVC plumbing. So we've got an opportunity to really kind of cement the information by practicing as well. But it's it's been a response to demand from the industry. And I think we talked a little bit yesterday too about just there's a, there's a change and um, people are hungry for training, whether it's in leak detection or anything else. They're looking for a place where they can kind of gain that confidence to get to a point where they're ready to go out and do it themselves. Yeah. I think it really gives, and I felt it yesterday, gives you the confidence of, all right, I, I heard what you told me. Now I, I play with it for a while and now I kind of get, I can, I can go out and do it. Cause you know, a lot of times that's that little piece that people need to that little push. It's a cool option to provide, you know, I know it's not like required, but yeah. it's a, it's a really, you know, for the younger generation coming in and, and the millennials, if you want to call it, or, and it's just like, sometimes they need that little piece of encouragement or push to be like, all right, I feel, I feel confident enough now to go do it. Whereas before with the older generation, they may have just done a more trial and error and been comfortable doing that. But now, you know, we're not, we're not so keen on that. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I think <laughs> us older generation, it, the trial and error isn't necessarily something that's better it's just sure. the result of what we had available to us right. i think there's just a lot more opportunity for delivery of good information and right. so as a result people are more intent on collecting that and that's really smart because it shortcuts the the process of being effective at doing it yeah. and what we what we try to teach and what we've always been able to teach in the classroom are, are three main things that we found really separated the good guys from the bad guys and or not good guys, bad guys, effective leak <laughs> detectors to not so effective ones. Sure. And it was that they they followed a systematic procedure, the effective ones did. They understood the principles or the, the physics behind the tests that they were doing, and they understood their equipment. And Brad talked a little bit about how, you know, it's not, the, the equipment is not the leak detector. The equipment does something specific. It's either listening to sounds in the ground or it's tracking electricity in the pool. It's really important to be able to understand the limitations of that equipment and what it can actually do. So we can teach those three things pretty well in the classroom. What's the procedure that's going to be effective and make you efficient? What are the physics and the principles you should understand so you're confident with your tests? And what's the equipment and where does it get pulled out and used and how do you use it effectively? But there's one more characteristic, and that's what you were talking about here. It's that that confidence to get out in the field and actually start applying it and doing it. And I think that's really where the knowledge becomes cemented because you have the opportunity to, to, to through trial and error, see how the stuff that you learned in the classroom is actually applied and provides rewards. Mm -hmm. um, and we give a, a chance to do that as a start here with the hands-on, but... Uh, Really, what we're trying to do is get people to the point where they're confident enough and understand that it's not so difficult that they can go out and be effective, like Brad was on his first couple jobs. Mm -hmm. um, you can be effective pretty early on, and then as you keep doing it, you're going to become more and more skillful and truly become artistic, so to speak, at doing sure. leak detection. 
Yeah. I think do even as we were walking through some of the case studies and things yesterday, it's just an opportunity to see the headaches that I walked through and the uh, challenges that I had and maybe skip some of those headaches and have a few more light bulbs that come on. Oh yeah, that makes sense. Or kind of bring it together. So when you do get out into the field, you hit the ground running. So Yeah. That's the piece that I like the most about how, you know, when you find those things, what's, what do you do with it? You know, that's the piece that's, I think sometimes difficult or the trial and error piece that people go through that they may spend hours, you know, yeah. doing, but if you can teach them kind of that process that, that eliminates a lot of time or, you know, that's wasted on the job. Yeah. Well, maybe not wasted, but <laughs> yeah. a lot of learning. Time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and we, we have people who have come to training who have really have had very little leak experience at all. They've gone through a day of training and they have leak detection businesses right now that they're mm. operating. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And we've had guys that have been in it a long time that have come as part of a group and they've been kind of sitting there and every once in a while they go, oh, yeah, you know, I've been doing that, but I didn't necessarily know why I've been doing that or I, that does make sense. I should do that. Use, right. Use water for my pressure test instead of air. That would be less confusing. I, I get that, you know, so. That's cool. Yeah. yeah, it's a fun thing, and it's a, it's a good thing to offer for for people. I think, like I said, it just getting that confidence piece is a big boost for sure. I wanted to go back just time. Can you talk about, like, the when you're finding these leaks, like what kind of options you guys have for patching those leaks or filling those? You know, we talked about yeah. the vinyl liner patch, but what are some other things that you guys have that would fill some of those? Yeah. I mean, when you've got a leak, you've got – options anywhere from not doing anything just letting it keep leaking to trashing your pool and getting a whole new pool you right. know and we've got a lot of different repair options in between there we've got we kind of classify them as temporary repairs long-term repairs or like a replacement or renovation and uh the leak master brand that we have does a lot in that temporary to long-term repair where you can get a leak situation working again and don't have to have the big cost of a renovation or a replacement. Um, we've got everything from putties to pool glue to sealants, um, things where you can really make a, a leak look good and, and not be leaking without a whole lot of expense to it. So, Yeah, I think you know customers are concerned when you're out there looking for a leak for them. Their first concern is that they're losing water and they want that to stop. And so... As a leak detector, one of your first options might be to propose to the customer that I have a patch that I can do that will solve your problem right now. It may not be a permanent repair, um, but as a result, the cost isn't real high. And then that would be things like the putties and a flexible sealer, topical repairs that are being made over the surface to stop that crack. And that might be necessary even if you want to pass the repair job off to somebody else who has more of an ability to do a more extensive concrete repair or something like that. But then we do have other types of tools, uh, crack injection systems for injecting a foam into a concrete crack. That's kind of the next step up. It's, again, not going to be doing what an engineer might do if he was to come to the pool and really relook at the whole structure. But it is going to uh, put a material into the crack itself and seal that up with a rubber sealant that's going to withstand some movement so that that repair or that crack is not going to leak over a longer period of time. Right. Um, and then there's more extensive repairs that can be done to it. In some cases, we're, we don't have products or tools for that, but that certainly is an area that those that get into leak detection have found is a real profitable thing. If they have the expertise, um, just the ability to find leaks is a good way to find the business where they might be able to utilize their skills in that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, you know, one thing for me when I do go out and do the leak detection jobs, I putty and patches is just something that's kind of included into my general fee for it. I mean, I might, if there's a lot of patches, I might charge a little bit more. But uh, we also have some options like the Leak Master Pool Glue has been a real good fix for a long-term fix something in a skimmer bowl or a main drain bowl some type of fitting something like that and that's something then i upcharge the customer for just an additional charge but it's going to be a long-term fix instead of a putty which may be long-term but might be something that pops off 
a little ways down the road. So I kind of like to give the customer different options and just help them to understand what's out there and let them make the decision. So Yeah, I like that that chart you threw up yesterday just about like from from, you know, not fixing leak to complete new pool and showing them where yeah. you know, what what their pool where it fits in these options and like this is maybe what you can do and giving them the knowledge on making a choice for their pool but explaining to them each piece, you know, that this may not hold very long. It may hold yeah. two weeks or it may hold, you know, yeah. 10 years or, you know, but just explaining each piece of like option to the homeowner and giving them that option. Cause not, you know, I think sometimes people might just say, Oh, you know, you have a crack and you need to, you know, replace the whole pool. And that's not yeah. always the case. It's you want to take care of that customer, giving them the options and, yeah. you know, let, you know, you may push them in one direction or the other based on your expertise, you know, what you think would work best. But, at the same time, you want to give them that still good customer service experience. Sure. That's really important. I mean, it's really important in, in all cases to treat your customer as you'd like to be treated yourself. And what you want is you want to know what's the nature of my problem and what are the repair options I have. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes we're looking for an expert who tells us absolutely what should be done. Sure. But um, if we're going to take on the role of that expert, we've got to be responsible in what we're proposing and make sure that it's really in the best interest of the customer, not just in the best interest of our pocketbook all the time. It shows your professionalism too. You know, it's some people may think you're trying to take advantage of them. If you're just going from zero to a hundred, you know, you're, you're showing how expert, you know, your expertise on things and, you know, giving them options shows that I think, Mm -hmm. as opposed to them feeling like you're just trying to, to get them to spend the most money possible. Right. And it's nice to have options that you can do. And this is where you can, in a leak detection business, you can kind of determine to what level you want to go to be able to be this the one that provides the options yeah. that you're recommending. And we have plenty of uh, customers of ours who have successful leak detecting businesses who do nothing more than put vinyl liner patches on pools, and that's the extent, or putty, that's the extent of their repairs. They're yeah. jobbing everything else out to somebody else. Yeah. On the other hand, if you want to do it yourself and do more, there's great options for that too. Yeah. And you know, one thing we didn't talk about in the leak detection process is kind of the importance of being able to dive the pool mm-hmm. also. And I think that is something that if you're going to get into the business, that you're going to have a need at some point to get in the water and you can't be afraid of doing that. Um and having the ability to breathe underwater with a scuba tank or a compressor operated dive unit is pretty helpful. And that, that I think when you're getting into like the concrete pools and we talked about dye testing, in order to really do good dye testing down at a main drain or a or a light, that is a another aspect of the job that we didn't touch on yeah. completely. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a lot of our tools are designed to keep you out of the pool so you don't have to get in. But even with that, about half the time I get into the pool. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you want to make sure you're doing the the good job. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Thorough as you can. Yeah. For sure. Well, thanks for sharing all the technical stuff with us. Let's talk a little bit more kind of about the business side. You know, you talked about the importance of selling to the independent guys. Can you tell us more about that? Why it's a passion of yours? Yeah. You know, I... Over the years, I guess I've I've been around enough to see vendors of ours and customers of ours and things like that get bought out by bigger companies or private equity firms or things like that. And I've I've just noticed that the quality of the product goes down when somebody is owned by a financial interest rather than owned by the owner operator. Hmm. It seems like the the owner operators have more of a sense of the value that I'm producing is the product that I'm producing for the customer. So they really have a care in making sure that that is delivered and it really truly is valuable. Whereas when the, the companies become more financially motivated, the the incentives that the employees have, it's easier to establish a financial incentive than it is to say, hey, let's let's do good for the customer. And if you're measured by financial incentives, it becomes apparent and in our cases, vendors that have been purchased don't provide as good of products. Hmm. So in kind of our interest in maintaining a health in the industry, we're just really enthused to see that there are a lot of owner-operator businesses that are out there, whether it's a family 
cool business up in the northern part of the United States that does a whole gamut of leak detect or of swimming pool services, or it's somebody who's a specialist in leak detection. They're operating out of their home with a truck, and they go home at night and produce reports and invoices. Um, we think the quality of the product that gets received by the pool owner is better when it comes from an independent person like that. Mm. Um, so I think that's part of where our passion for that comes. I guess it comes also just from the fact that we want to remain that way ourselves, and we feel that that's been kind of critical to how we've been able to grow and be successful and feel like we're needed by our customers also. So yeah. in addition to kind of helping our customers do that, uh, we're kind of providing a little bit of a commitment to them as well and saying, hey, that's the way we're going to keep doing business for ourselves also. Yeah. Yeah, I think you get you give them that real customer experience. I think there are a lot of large successful companies that that do a good job at that, but a lot of companies don't yeah. as well. So you know, there's a if you got a good owner and a good good management team and good systems, it's you can still be done to provide that. But a lot of times that piece is missing if they're just throwing money at it. So you know, there's a there's a gap between there. But the the small operated you know, owner-operator businesses, you can really feel, you know, that connection with the customer and the other, I think the customer can feel that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and we even felt that running our company as Greg and I st stepped back from cleaning the pools ourselves, you know, there was a hit we took from some of those customers and we, we still did our best to take care of them, but you yeah. know, there's still a little bit of a hit of like, I'm not going to see you every day anymore or every week. And it's like, no, yeah. you know, we have to, we're growing and, yeah. but we're going to try to put the best person in place for you. But there's just that people feel it, you know, yeah. as as you go and grow, and it's another whole thing to try to keep that as you grow. But yeah, yeah. and I think you know, I I agree with you that businesses can grow and still maintain that customer focus certainly, and mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be that the guy who owns the business is the guy out there doing the work. Although that's that's great too. Sure, but it's just that there's the financial interest is in there on a daily basis and really cares about the product that's being delivered more than they care about just the bottom line mm -hmm. that's coming in. Yeah. And then as the owner, you're always going to be the one that feels it the most, you know, mm -hmm. that you're, you, nobody's ever going to do it fully exactly like you, you know, you can get them close, but yeah. there's always that extra piece that yeah. you, you'll go, you'll go above and beyond, you know, some of your team sometimes, you know, it's just, how it is so if there's a if there's a person behind the product that person is going to be interested in keeping their reputation good and i think it's just a good way of affirming that there's going to be a a win-win relationship between the customer and the provider yeah well, i think it's what we've talked about it's all been really good and you can like see the options available to us to a company right you can we take down the scary wall of elite detection and you can see that, you know, there might be a spot for you to implement this in your business, or you may want to just find a specialist that can do it. So you can, there's pieces of it, but you don't want to like take away the specialist because at a certain point you definitely need more thorough training on how to repair cracks and how to remodel pools and do, you know, all this stuff that, that a more specialist with a team would need to do. But there's also pieces, you know, that from, you know, running a, a pool service company that I can see implementing along the way that can help you as another source of income. We talk about quite a bit of, you know, it's hard balancing everything and especially some of these seasonal places, you know, it's, it's looking, always looking for options out there that help replace some of that income. So there's pieces in it that you can do that, you know, if you get trained on it or you learn it properly through videos and training that you can incorporate and then there's also a step like that you would hand it off you know yeah. there's there's some way of figuring it out but it's not super scary it's just it can be embraced for something good yeah absolutely you know the the, the thing is that leaks are an unavoidable part of the swimming pool industry yeah. i think everybody that's in the swimming pool industry is going to have to deal with leaks somehow or another so right. you, you ought to have a plan how you're going to do it and how you're going to take care of your customers who are suffering from that tragedy, as we talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. And um, just like what you said, Tyler, you know, it might be that you've got somebody you trust as a specialist who has really invested the time in learning how to do this well, and they have the equipment. And if you can pass your customer off to somebody that you trust, then that's the smart way to do it for your business. You're providing value to that customer. I think right. we, we find from our customers that at some, at some point, some of them say, hey, you know what? 
I'd be better off doing this myself. Mm -hmm. And so what we want to try to do is make that accessible to them if they choose to do it. And they can do it at a wide range of levels, sure. whether it's learning how to just do that simple dye test that Brad talked about is his initial assessment. And amazingly enough, a lot of leaks get found that way. So you mm -hmm. can be in the leak detection business with just a dye tester. Sure. Um, as long as you know then when to pass it off and how to pass it off effectively to somebody who you trust. Yeah. And I think, you know, we don't want to take away from the specialists, you know, because they are, that is definitely a skill set that they've earned and learned and spent time learning. But, you know, as an owner or, you know, out being out there servicing pools, the more knowledge you have and the more knowledge you can give to a customer. So if you learn a few things here and there, maybe you can charge for them or, or maybe you don't, but you figure out you, you can still provide value to the customer by understanding these things and being able to show them, well, I do know you have a leak and this is why. So this is, you know, I'm going to pass you on to, you know, this company or whatever, or yeah, I have a couple patches I can do it and you can, you can solve the problem for them, you know? Yeah. So there's, there's all different levels, but don't definitely don't want to take away from the specialists because they do spend a lot of time in it and are much more effective in certain areas. Absolutely. The specialists are really important, especially in certain parts of the country where there's just a lot more pools and there's right. a lot more work to do just to the service and you can specialize in, in other things. Right. So we talked about, you know, the, the process and we talked about the tools, which are definitely important aspects, but putting it into place as a business plan, you know, is a lot different. And we're sitting here with, you know, with all your core values above us. And, you know, I really like how you talked yesterday about incorporating these things into business. So can you touch base on some of those business practices? Yeah, sure. I mean, the, the values that we have on the wall are something that took a long time to develop and um, we kind of went through a process at one point that a lot of businesses do where you take a look at what's your mission and what's your vision and what are your values and kind of the, the common uh, consultancy or the advice is that everybody should have one of those a mission and a vision statement and a set of values and we tried to come up with a set of values and it's usually suggested that you have three or four or five that are specific and unique to you and that made sense. I think there is we have a personality that is expressed by what we value. Mm -hmm. But we also found as I as I tried to make a list of values, I found it really difficult to exclude any of the values that I found to be admirable. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up with a pretty long list that was probably twice as long as the suggested <laughs> three or four. Right, right, right. And and the other uh the other challenge I ran into was that I found that as I chose some of these values to pursue, like generosity, let's say, that's something that we can, we can pretty much agree is a good thing mm -hmm. to go after. But there were times where I had to fire an employee because we weren't delivering a good enough product based on the work that he was doing. Sure. And I didn't feel very generous when I was telling that guy it was time for him to go. But it was still necessary for me to kind of create value for my customers. So the second, the, the first dilemma was it was hard to make, choose a small list of values. And the second dilemma was it was hard to administer all values all the time. Mm. And um, so what I came up with was what I call a value cycle. And it's a value cycle because it's a cycle, a dynamic cycle that's used to produce value. But it also provides a way for me to organize the values that we identified to say, here's when they should appropriately be applied. And for, for our value statement, we have a couple that are kind of unique and permanent all the time, and that is integrity and honesty. No matter what the stage of the, of the cycle is, it's paramount for us to be honest with our employees and our customers and our vendors and even our competitors. Um, we also think it's important to be humble because even though we want to keep trying to improve and work towards perfection, we're not always going to be good at that. So we've got to recognize and be willing to admit our mistakes and also to admit and forgive the mistakes of others. Sure. But beyond those that are kind of permanent, we found that courage and discernment and generosity and diligence and accuracy and joy were other things that were important to us, but they were important particularly where they ended up being applied in the value cycle. So we say that we discover opportunities with courage. We go out there and, and we're not afraid to listen with big ears to find out what might be needed. And we're not afraid to pursue those things if they might be different yeah. than what we already offer. Um, we then develop with discernment. So here we're, 
we're not just going out with courage. Now we're really trying to focus on uh, how do we make this be right? How do we cross all the T's and dot all the I's and check all the check boxes? And then once we've got a product that's passed that discernment test, then we market with generosity. And when we talk about marketing with generosity, we're particularly generous with information. We want to make sure that the customer has all that they need to make a reasoned and informed decision. And um, I think that kind of gets back to what we were talking about with proposing repairs, for instance, for customers. Mm -hmm. you, we want to treat our customers as if they can make good, logical, smart decisions themselves and give them the information to do that. So we don't withhold it information. information. Mm -hmm. Once we've got a, an agreement to produce a product, we've got to then produce with diligence. We've got to do it in such a way that it delivers on what we promised, and we make it efficiently so we can generate enough revenue um, to keep going. And so once we've completed that transaction, we account with accuracy, making sure that we're being accurate and fully understanding everything that went to play in measuring the success of this. And hopefully we've generated some value for ourselves out of the whole process as we complete the cycle and we've got some resources or some rewards to distribute and we talk about distributing those joyfully then so joy is the last one mm -hmm. and then finally you get to kind of the, the top of the cycle and you rest with humility in order to get ready to go do it all over again so <laughs> that's kind of a a big explanation for what our values are um but they they make sense to us and they help us operate. And we, we think that they have application to others as well. Yeah. I, I, I wanted to incorporate that in the conversation because I think you can feel all that. You know, I read through them all yesterday and you can feel all that being here and seeing the quality of the product and how important it is to you and, and providing the most value to your customers and seeing that and giving them all the options and listening to them. You know, there's just a lot that you can see and feel here that, you know, I wanted to share that. Yeah. So thanks for Good. going through all that. And yeah. I think it's a lot of those are important for many businesses, you know, to stay profitable and to stay successful. You have to implement different things like that around the business to make sure that you continue to, to work. Keep going. Kind of got to keep the cycle going. And I think what, what I found is the reason it works as a cycle is you want to keep you want to keep rotational energy going. That's how we work as businesses. And uh, by appropriately applying those values at the appropriate time you're you're generating that yeah for sure i mean you guys have been around for a very long time and you know i i know several leak detection companies that use your equipment and i know that's that's very important to you and you know you share you know, I, I learned that you guys you know you said you had like over 500 companies that have leak or detection in their name that you guys help out and that's pretty it's pretty awesome you guys pr definitely provide a great quality product, you know, and that's why we wanted to, to work with you guys. And I can see that. So, oh, it's nice uh, to, <laughs> nice to have you here and be, be selected as yeah. somebody that you'd like to work with. So, yeah. So let's say a company wants to look into getting leak detection as an option for their business. Where would they start? I'd say start with a phone call. I mean, just good for us to hear kind of where you're at and what your specific goals and needs are. We can walk through the opportunity that's available and then get you lined up with uh, information you need based on the free resources we have online or getting you registered for a training course here and then also get you the equipment that's right for you when you step in. We've got several equipment packages and we have kind of a basic starter package all the way up to a specialist package and uh but really, we sell everything a la carte because we want to make sure you guys only get the stuff that you need. So, yeah. And, you know, the resources, a phone call is great. We've got three of us, three or four of us here that can answer questions over the phone, and we do actually answer our phones and talk to the people that call. Um, and Brad mentioned also free resources that are on our website. One of them was the evaporation index that we talked about a little bit earlier. But... Um, most all of the information that we present in the training classes, other than the hands-on stuff, is available for free online. And so as someone's thinking about dabbling in leak detection, they don't necessarily have to make the commitment to come to training. I would suggest going on to our website, taking a look at some of the slideshows and the articles that have been written. Pretty good understanding of what it takes to get started and maybe figure out that you can get started at this with a pretty small investment. 
Yeah, I think you know doing their doing their research yourself and seeing if it's something you want to do, but also calling in and figuring out you know what exactly you need because you may not know. And by talking to you guys, you can say, yeah, I'm in a in a region with mostly vinyl liner pools, and you can point them in a direction. Or in our case, in Arizona, where a lot of concrete or shotcrete pools, so you know it's different equipment for those those jobs. So you know, reaching out to help you guys. And then, you know, there's nothing better than hands-on. So, yeah. you know, if you can come out and do the training and learn it, it's going to be more valuable for sure. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah, I do have a – I watched a lot of videos prior to coming here. I mean, there's a lot you can learn through yeah. that, through the website too. So that's yeah. cool that you guys provide that information for people. You bet. And we're available also after the sale. I mean, call us if you're interested in getting into it. But call us also if you've ever purchased any of our equipment and you're out there using it and you're not sure exactly how to use it uh, well or you want to be more successful, we're happy to spend time on the phone talking you through it, even if you're at the job site and you have some questions and you're wondering how to use it. Um, please give us a call because that's, that's what we do most of the day yeah. is uh, help people solve problems. We want you to be profitable finding leaks. Right. And what's your, what's your website again? Yeah, a good website is leaktools.com, L-E-A-K-T-O-O-L-S.com. All right. One last question I'd kind of like to ask, and you can both answer it. Um, do you have a book or podcast that's made an impact on your life, and, and why? <laughs> yeah, you know, I... Or you have several, I but have we can several. get through it. It's okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I, they all yeah. help. <laughs> yeah, yep. Well, I, 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 I mean, I certainly find inspiration from the biological records of Christ's life, especially by Matthew and John. Um, I think it's helpful to read those. And, and Jefferson talked about Christ being the, or Jesus Christ being the prime example of moral teaching. And um, that comes through in those, those books. So um, that's a, a real major part of providing some uh, guidance to me. But I've also found that, um, you know, a book that I read really early on when I was getting started, a couple of them by Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence People is another one of those kind of core foundational books. He yeah. has another one, How to Stop Worrying and Start Living, mm -hmm. that was really good as well. Um, and then I read In Search of Excellence by Tom Peters a while ago also, which is another older book, but still has kind of foundational stuff. So, um, yeah, those are the, those are kind of the, you, when you asked me about what influenced our business, I ended up having to kind of go back to the foundational ones. Sure. I read a lot more now, and there's a lot of good stuff out there. What I tend to like is books that encourage me to think for myself and think logically and observe well, mm -hmm. rather than kind of give me a list of things that I should do. And um, I think that's what all these have done for me. Very cool. Yeah, I think it's, it's all important for foundational pieces, you know. Mm -hmm. Do you want to share one? I don't really have much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. See. yeah. I mean, I, I definitely read the Bible and, and use some of that wisdom. I would hope life. so as a youth pastor. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, I'm, I, uh, I enjoy reading. I read some of the Jack Reacher books for entertainment purposes. But, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, Desiring God was a big one for me kind of showed me how to pursue God. And when I pursued God, I also kind of pursued, pursued what was right and good and true. And I've seen the benefits of that in my life, both at home and at work and places like that. So, yeah. Well, that's yeah. a good one. Yeah. <laughs> I think we, we kind of try not to, we don't want to wear it on our sleeve, but we want it to be obvious that we're driven and motivated by something better. So for me, this business is a, is a ministry. It's the way that I've been created to do something good. And so it, it better be something that I'm on a daily basis, on a permanent basis, trying to be pursuing what is good and judging myself as to whether I'm really doing it. Yeah. And I think, you know, regardless of how you feel about religion or anything, you know, the, the morals that, you, like you said, Jefferson talks about, mm -hmm. the morals are are very similar. You know, yeah. you can imply, apply those morals regardless of, you know, your what your th beliefs are, and they still apply. And that's how you treat people, right, and how you run a, a proper business. You know, all those morals are honesty, integrity, you know, yeah. all that stuff is a piece of it. So, well, well. 
we really appreciate you guys spending time with us and training us yesterday and we had a really good time learning all that definitely opened our eyes to a lot we've enjoyed you know getting to know you guys a lot better so thank you so much for for coming on the podcast and spending time with us oh thanks for having us and uh yeah like your business too great to see it grow and keep keep going so yeah, and thanks for coming up to minnesota got to drive around in the snow a little bit last night so <laughs> way to go you're yeah. still here Good job. <laughs> cool well thank you all right Thanks for checking out this episode. If you want to find out more about our guests or the sponsors of the show, you can check them out on the links we have provided in the write-up below. We have also provided links to our social media platforms, so please follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Our tag is Pool Chasers. If the podcast has brought you any value, please do what you can to support us through our Patreon page by going to patreon.com forward slash pool chasers. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast to be updated each time a new episode is released. One last thing. If you're not yet in our Facebook group, join it today to be surrounded by like-minded individuals who are all trying to better the industry. Thank you all for the support. We appreciate your time and your ear. See you out there, pool chasers. chasers.